Welcome to Bullet Point Nursing. My name is Dr. Goldstein, and in this lecture series, we're gonna go through essentially everything that you need to know relating to nursing pharmacology. Whether you're here as a nurse, a nursing student, or a nurse practitioner student, I hope you find this channel helpful. The notes that we're gonna be using in this lecture can be found at our website, and I hope you print them and use them to follow along. Today, we're gonna to be going through angina. So let's go ahead and let's first begin by talking a little bit of pathophysiology review, because without that, we really can't begin to understand the pharmacology that we're gonna be talking about. So angina is a clinical diagnosis, and what does it mean? It is when a patient's oxygen demand exceeds the supply in the heart. Most of you are likely familiar with the concept of supply and demand. You don't need to be a business major to understand that. We need supply and demand to be equal. It becomes a problem if we have too little supply or too much demand. So what's going on in angina? In angina, we have the problem that the patient's heart, the patient's body is demanding too much oxygen and the heart the vascular, the vasculature, the blood, the blood cells, the respiratory system, all of it, at some point, there is a breakdown and it's not supplying enough oxygen, enough blood. So again, it's a supply and demand problem. The heart and the body needs more, it's demanding more, and the supply is not able to keep up with it. And it could be from so many different problems. It could be a supply problem. It could be that we're not breathing, we're not getting enough oxygen in. It could be we don't have good enough blood pressure, we're not circulating the blood. It could be that we're exercising too much or stressed too much, so the demand is too high. It could be for a lot of different reasons. The classic symptom of angina is chest pain or chest discomfort. Now, there's a difference between stable angina and unstable angina, and that's a whole lecture in and of itself, way outside the realm of pharmacology. But for our purposes, stable angina is when the chest pain comes in a predictable pattern. The classic example would be someone knows every time I walk 100 yards to my mailbox, every time I get in a fight with my wife, I get chest pain. Why? Because I'm putting extra stress on my body, so there is an increased demand and my heart is just not able to meet that increased demand. It could be for a lot of different reasons. Usually it's just poor heart health. So I'm unable to meet the demand. So I have uh, chest pain. When we talk about a patient having chest pain, there's lots of different reasons a patient could have chest pain. That's one of the most common uh, reasons that patients show up in the ERs in the United States, that's in the top 10 every year, um, is chest pain. However, most chest pain is not cardiac related. Today, we're only gonna talk about cardiac related chest pain. So when we talk about cardiac related chest pain, that is a sign that the heart cells are not getting enough oxygen for any one of a bunch of reasons, but that's what we're gonna be talking about today. That's what angina is, where the heart cells are not getting enough oxygen because of a supply and demand problem. Let's talk about the first medication. And we don't have a whole lot of pharmacology in this lecture. The first class of drugs we're going to go through are nitrates. The, obviously, the most common drug here is nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin's mechanism of action is it dilates the veins. It actually also can dilate arteries a little bit. But the primary pathophysiology that we're going to talk about for this medication is that it dilates the veins. What does that do? Well, that improves cardiac circulation, cardiac output. And by doing all that, we improve the blood and oxygen delivery. One more time, it dilates the veins and that brings improved blood flow, which brings improved oxygenation. If you haven't figured it out already, this increases our supply. It's a supply and demand problem. This increases our supply. An easy trick that I used to use to help me remember what nitroglycerin does, nitro blows things up. Nitroglycerin is actually an explosive that's used in demolition. We use it to blow up mountains and things like that. We use it to blow things up. Same thing, it blows up our veins, it makes them bigger, and because of that, it increases our supply. I do wanna take a second and go back. We said this is a supply and demand problem, and this is outside of pharmacology, but I still feel it's important to mention it here. The first thing we do when a patient gets chest pain because of, a, because of classic angina, supply and demand problem, the first thing we tell the patient to do is what? Is to sit down and relax, why? because that decreases our, our demand. The medication is gonna bring up our supply, but we wanna do both. We wanna bring down demand, increase supply, so that we get back to equilibrium, we get back to homeostasis. So one more time, the first intervention, because this is fair game on a pharmacology test, 
the first intervention for a patient having chest pain would be to rest and relax. The second intervention or the first pharmacotherapeutic intervention, that would be nitrates. So let's keep going. Nitrates are the first line drug for a patient having angina. And we already talked about the mechanism of action. We also use this drug for heart failure. We're gonna to focus today on acute angina. And as we go through the pharmacology of this medication, there's no special thing that you would have to know in relation to heart failure. The adverse effects of this medication, it can cause a headache. It can cause orthostatic hypotension and reflex tachycardia. I wanna point out a few things so to help you understand and really memorize these and to help you get a good grasp on whatever test questions you may get. Because again, one of the favorite places to get test questions, indications, mechanism of action, patient education and side or adverse effects. So for a headache, this medication dilates blood vessels. Well, I have blood vessels in my brain and in my skull, it's a fixed space. So if I make the blood cells bigger, then essentially what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna be squishing the brain because the brain, if I, the blood starts to take up more space, now there's less space for the brain. I'm gonna squish the brain, causing a headache. That's not exactly the way it works, but it's a really good way to conceptualize it certainly a good way to uh, predict, to explain that and to help you memorize what it does. This medication is known to cause a headache. That's not an allergic reaction. It's not anything else. If a patient develops a headache, let the provider know. Usually we can give them something, unless it's contraindicated, Tylenol, something like that, to relieve that headache. But that is a known expected adverse effect. Next, we have orthostatic and reflex tachycardia. Again, we've covered this a number of times if you've watched previous videos. What does that mean? That means that A, you need to educate your patient to slowly get up from seated positions. You need to understand that orthostatic hypotension is very often going to be together with reflex tachycardia because they go hand in hand. Orthostatic hypotension is your blood pressure suddenly dropping and reflex tachycardia is your heart rate suddenly going up. Well, that makes perfect sense. If my blood pressure suddenly drops, yes, my heart rate should suddenly go up to compensate for that. This medication is available by... Um, three primary routes, sublingual, transdermal, and IV. Let's go over a few things here because these are there's a few things to know that are really important about this. First of all, when we give this medication for a patient that has angina, so we say the common expression you may have heard is go pop a nitro, that's where the patient's going to take a nitroglycerin. That is almost always going to be sublingual. That's where they put a pill or a spray under the tongue and the medication is absorbed into their mucous membranes. That is one route of medication administration, and the onset there is roughly around five minutes. When you're handling um, the patient's medication, please wear gloves because we do know that it can be uh, transferred to the nurse if they get it on their skin, for example, the spray. Next, we know, uh, next thing we're going to talk about is the transdermal route. The transdermal route is going to be strictly used for chronic long-term angina prevention. IV is going to be used for acute. So one more time, because I think I said that a little confusing. The sublingual route and the IV route are what we use for acute angina. The patient right now is having chest pain related to a supply and demand problem versus transdermal nitro is going to be long-term chronic management of angina. It's two different problems. If you watch previous lectures, something like uh, in pulmonology, we have medications for acute asthma and we have medications for prevention of asthma. Same thing here. We have medications for acute chest pain and we have medications for chronic long-term management of angina. So to recap, this patient is having sudden onset chest pain that's related to angina. We're gonna give them sublingual nitro or they can take it themselves. If we're in the hospital setting, we may give them sublingual nitro or we may be giving them IV nitroglycerin. The dosing, and it's very rare for me to include dosing on here. However, this is such a well-known dose. Um, so I did put it on here because some uh, textbooks and some uh, nursing curriculums may require you to know this. The dose is 0.4 milligrams or 400 micrograms. You should absolutely know that this is dosed every five minutes up to three doses not to exceed three doses. If after three doses, they haven't gotten relief, probably after the first or second dose, if they haven't gotten relief, we should be calling 911. Definitely after the third dose, if they haven't gotten relief, the answer is call 911. The answer is not gonna be, go ahead and keep taking nitroglycerin. Now, outside the hospital setting, we're, uh, there's only so much we could do in terms of telling patients to check their blood pressure, things like that. So that's not really gonna be something that is your responsibility to educate patients on. However, as a nurse in the hospital, 
you are absolutely going to assess the patient's blood pressure before and after you give a patient this medication. Remember, when we assess a patient after, we're also assessing for what? For the condition we're treating, chest pain. So you have to assess, are you having any pain now? If yes, tell me on a scale of 1 to 10. Additionally, we're going to assess for any adverse effects, or we're going to ask them, are you having a headache, things like that. Um, if you're giving a patient a prescription for PRN nitroglycerin, you should be educating them in general about their medication, about their condition. You should explain to them they, when they start to feel that chest pain, they need to sit down and rest or else it is not going to get better. You should explain to them, like we already said, that if this is not helping, after a certain number of doses, certainly after three doses, they should be getting emergency medical attention. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the transdermal route. So the transdermal route, we said, is not for acute angina. It is for chronic angina, prevention, long-term management. I use all of those terms interchangeably, long-term management or chronic management. So that's what it's used for. In that case, we have the patient give it via the transdermal route. That's going to be attached. They place on a clean, dry area of skin. Okay, take note of this because all of these can be test questions, certainly at the nursing level. We place it on a clean, dry patch of skin, and nitroglycerin will sit there for up to 12 hours a day. We do not leave this patch on continuously for 24 hours because the body can build up a tolerance to it, and then A, it's not going to work, and B, they're going to need it all the time. So we want to make sure that we take what's called a dosification. So this medication, it can be on for up to about 12 hours, and then it should be off for roughly 12 hours. And depending on your uh, textbook or the actual patient's provider, they may give them a little wiggle room, they may give 16 hours, something like that. But the point is they can't have it on continuously. Same logic, you can't take it continuously. Most guidelines recommend that if you're taking this medication, you take it six days a week and not seven for the same reason. One thing that's really common to see on test questions, on test things, whether you're at the nursing level or the nurse practitioner level, is that you cannot take this medication with any of the um, erectile dysfunction medications, specifically the PDE5 inhibitors, such as sildenafil, verdanafil, or tadalafil. If you've taken any of those within 48 to 72 hours, this medication is contraindicated. However, if the patient needs it, or if, I'm sorry, if it's been ordered by the provider, double check with the provider prior to administering it. They may still decide to go ahead and give it. But do know for testing purposes, that is considered a contraindication that if a patient had any of those medications in the previous 48 to 72 hours, depending which one is why there's a window there, you are going to be, uh, this medication is going to be considered contraindicated. Keep in mind, because of that, it is a fair game test question to ask what must you inquire about your patient prior to administering nitroglycerin? And this would be a correct answer. Have you taken blah, blah. Next, this medication is contraindicated in a patient with a right ventricular MI. I am not getting any more into that because that could be a whole separate lecture, but a patient is having a right ventricular MI, a right-sided heart attack, they should not get nitroglycerin, and that gets a little bit complex, so we're not going to get into that as to why. Patients that do become hypotensive because of their nitroglycerin, whether it's IV or sublingual, they should be treated with normal saline with regular fluid. That's a pretty common, relatively common occurrence, so that it probably is fair game, even at the RN level, to know that. Finally, we already discussed this. You must check the blood pressure before and after administration. You must check their pain level before and after administration. You must check for adverse effects, like a headache, after administration. Before we continue, since you are still here watching and hopefully enjoying this lecture series, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button. This content on this whole channel are all offered free as a resource for nurses, nursing students, nurse practitioners. This channel is just supported by you subscribing and enjoying this channel. Let's continue and let's talk about uh, the first line class of drugs we have for chronic angina. So, so far we covered for acute angina, patient who every time they walk 100 yards to the mailbox, they start to get chest pain, they have to relax, take a nitroglycerin, wait 20 minutes, it goes away, problem solved. That's really common. That's going to get nitroglycerin. However, for patients that have more severe, that it takes longer for the pain to go away, that it takes multiple nitro doses, whatever the case may be, where that paradigm of rest and a nitro isn't enough, they get put on an additional medication. And this is going to be a daily medication that they take to prevent them 
from getting that angina in the first place. So we talked about nitroglycerin can be used for that purpose, and that's true. However, that's not our first line agent. Our first line agent for this is gonna be a beta adrenergic antagonist, AKA beta blockers. We have a bunch of different drugs in this class, and if you've watched previous lectures, specifically the one on adrenergic agonists, we already talked about this drug, or I'm sorry, adrenergic receptors, we already talked about this drug class. But let's go through it one more time. The drugs in this class are propanolol, metoclopidol, labetalol, and others. How do these work? These block beta-1. Beta-1 makes the heart beat faster, harder, stronger. So this makes the heart beat less hard and less fast. So it slows things down in the heart. It makes it not work quite as hard when it's squeezing. And what's the purpose of that? You guessed it, to decrease demand. If I take this medication all the time, then my heart chronically has a lower demand. So the demand and the supply are hopefully, now that I lowered the demand and the patient's supply already sucks for whatever reason, but because I lowered the demand, I'm able to prevent the patient from getting angina in the first place. That's how this class of medication works. Everything else about this class of drugs, we talked about this many times, and we're still gonna talk about this more um, in hypertension and in other lectures, but really quick, the adverse effects of this drug class, we have fatigue, we have bradycardia, um, which makes sense. I am literally slowing down the heart rate with this medication, so it does cause bradycardia. Because I'm lowering the heart rate and I'm lowering how good the heart is pumping the blood, it may cause me to have less energy and be fatigued. This drug class does have a black box warning that if you are taking it chronically, as in exactly this case, you should not suddenly stop taking it because now you can already imagine if I lowered the demand and that's what the body got used to supplying, suddenly I stop taking it, the demand goes up, we have cardiac adverse effects. The rest of the items related to that class of drugs, I'm not gonna get into because we are gonna cover it in much more detail. Again, when we get to um, heart failure and hypertension, Plus, we already covered it previously when we talked about adrenergic medications. I will go over one more time because you can't say this enough. For testing purposes, make sure you know what to educate your patient to expect fatigue, what activities they may not be able to do anymore. Remember, if I'm treating them for angina, I need to be also um, educating them on angina. So it's fair game. If a patient's being prescribed nitroglycerin or a beta blocker for angina, what would you educate them? Well, I'd educate them that if they suddenly have chest pain, they should rest. I'd educate them that the chest pain doesn't go away like it usually does to call 911, all of these types of things. And obviously, anytime I give a medication that lowers the heart rate or the blood pressure, I must assess the heart rate and the blood pressure prior to administration, as well as after administration that's part of my reassessment. The next drug we have is called renolazine. There's not a whole lot we know about it. It's not at all a very commonly used drug. We know that its net effect is that it decreases the oxygen demand of the heart. That's what it ends, that's its end objective, and that's what it does. We just don't know exactly how it does that, but we do know that it does that. And again, that gets back to the point of treating chronic angina. This is not for acute, this is for chronic. But when we get back to treating chronic angina, we know that decreasing the demand is our goal. This drug does it. So this is another medication that's used for angina prevention. We don't use this a whole lot. I didn't include a whole lot out here, depending what textbook you're using, whether this drug is even listed or not. But it does have one prominent adverse effect of QT prolongation. I wouldn't expect too much else about this specific drug on any of your exams. Finally, I do want to point out that another option, we said the first line drug for acute angina it, or for chronic angina are beta blockers. That was first line. But then there's three other options. We just said renolazine. In the beginning, we said nitroglycerin, and here's your third alternative option, and that is calcium channel blockers. That's a whole separate class of drugs. We're gonna talk about that in other lectures. We're gonna talk about it in the hypertension lecture. We're gonna talk about it in the dysrhythmia lecture. But for right now, we're just gonna leave it at that. One more time, for acute angina, we have nitroglycerin, specifically sublingual and IV. For chronic uh, angina, we have first-line beta blockers, and then as other options, we have renolazine, transdermal only nitroglycerin, and finally calcium channel blockers. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.